Well, a very good afternoon. Uh, I have to admit, when uh, the question was just raised, who was here for the first time at InnoTown, I had to raise my hand because, um, well, I'm an InnoTown virgin. Uh, virgin. Um, so, as I'm sure many of you did, who are here for the first time, um, in preparation for today, I went online, visited the website, to get a bit of a feel for what sort of a conference this is. So I looked at all the photographs, and as I'm sure you saw, many of the video clips of previous speakers and of previous audiences. Um, and there were two things that struck me. The first thing is that in none of the video clips that I saw, I saw anyone wearing a tie, uh, which told me that this is a rather sort of informal conference. And the second thing that struck me is that it's sort of well, a, a very positive, upbeat conference. Um, a very optimistic view of what we can do in terms of innovation and change. And therefore, I immediately decided on the two things. Um, this is one of them, to wear a tie. Uh, and the second one I decided on is to say, well, I'm going to start this conference with what is really a rather, well, a really pessimistic talk, a really a negative talk. That's what I wanted to start out with. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start out with a very negative talk. Um, namely, I want to talk to you about why things don't work. And in fact, I think many of you will already grasp that very often things don't work in organizations. In fact, you will see that organizations, they do stuff with all the right intentions uh, to try and make things better. And in hindsight, we think, why, why did they do that? Sometimes whole industries do things in certain ways, which they think are the best ways of doing things. But when we really look at them, they actually don't make much sense. That's sort of what I call management myths. Ways we do things in business, sometimes in whole industries, with all the best intentions to try and make things better, which actually don't work, but which we keep doing. I said that's what I call management myths, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, as you say here, five reasons why such management myths don't disappear and sometimes continue to persist. Um, here are they, the five management myths. Um, collective inertia causal ambiguity, management myopia, self-perpetuating myths, and selection bias. <laughs> Which I'm sure you all agree are rather academic terms. So I thought I'd establish my credibility here up front that I'm really a professor. Um, but don't worry, I'll go through each of them in a logical sequence starting with number one to explain a little bit simpler terms what I really mean with them. So, what do we mean with this first one? Collective inertia. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of research on collective inertia, and actually the best way uh, that I found that I could explain what I mean with collective inertia is by uh, an experiment by a guy called Gordon Stevenson. And Gordon Stevenson um, was what was called a biological psychologist in the US in the 1950s. And a biological psychologist is basically someone who does research on primates, trying to learn something about human behavior. Now, what you also have to realize about the 1950s um, is that this was uh, the age before ethics committees in universities. <laughs> Meaning that you could do all sorts of research, which was rather interesting, which would be in today's terms be rather cruel or plain illegal. And Gordon did quite a bit of those experiments with primates and mostly with rhesus monkeys. And the experiment that I remember most vigorously um, is an experiment with five rhesus monkeys which uh, Gordon placed in a cage. In the middle of the cage, on a piece of string, he hung a banana. And underneath the banana, he placed a ladder. Now, as you can imagine, he sends these five monkeys into the cage. Five monkeys look around a bit and then, uh, ooh, spot a banana and a ladder. So, of course, they go towards the ladder. And then when the first one touches the ladder to start and climbing it, um, the monkey would get sprayed with ice-cold water. And in fact, not only the monkey touching the ladder would get sprayed with ice-cold water, all monkeys would get sprayed with ice-cold water. So what happened was the following, right? Oh, monkeys, the ladder, they kind the ladder, get sprayed with ice-cold water, they retreat a bit, and after a while, a second monkey, uh, the ladder gets sprayed with ice-cold water, and they retreat. And after a while, the monkeys get the message, you know? Banana or no banana, there's no climbing up the ladder in this place. Right? So they sit around and, oh, 
stare hungrily at the banana. Then Gordon did the following. He took out a monkey and replaced it with a new one. Oh, this monkey, being a monkey, looks around a bit, sees a ladder, banana, he starts racing towards the ladder. And then something interesting happened. The other four monkeys, who sort of know what's coming, jump up, start chasing after this monkey, and before he can get even near the ladder, they start beating him up. <laughs> so this monkey retreats, you know. <laughs> after a while, when he gets near the ladder again, the other four jump up and beat him up again. And after a while, this new monkey also gets the message, right? Banana or no banana, no climbing up the ladder in this place. <laughs> so he also sits there. Then Stevenson took out the second monkey and replaced it with a new one. The new monkey says, ooh, ladder, banana, starts racing towards the ladder, the other ones jump up. And interestingly, the first new monkey who had been replaced, who had no experience, no knowledge of the ice-cold water treatment, this new monkey also jumped up, started chasing after him, and with equal vigor and enthusiasm, joined in with the beating up of this new monkey. Stevenson replaced the new third monkey. Third monkey raced towards a lot of others and said, beat them up. Fourth monkey, oh, I'll jump up. Until all the monkeys in the cage had been replaced, none of them had any knowledge or experience with the ice cold water treatment. In fact, Stevenson had long turned off the sprinkler system. There was no ice cold water treatment. But none of them dared to go even near the ladder. And they just stared at the banana. Then Stevenson takes out a monkey, replaces it with a new one. Monkey says, ooh, let a banana. Starts racing towards the banana. The other ones jump up and beat him up. And this new monkey stops. And he said, why do you beat me up when I try to reach the banana? And the other four monkeys go, don't know. <laughs> but that's the way we do things around here. And in fact, many of the companies and managers that I see remind me of a bunch of monkeys in a cage. No one in particular. I haven't met any of you yet. But sometimes you say, well, that's the way we do things around here. But we don't quite remember why we do them that way. And that's what I mean with collective inertia. And you may actually think that this is a long way removed from the world of business. Now, let me tell you a little anecdote. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'm originally from the Netherlands, um, and I moved to the London in the year 2000. And in 2002 or so, I started, well, a bit later, 2003, I started working with the famous newspaper uh, called The Guardian, who actually owned The Guardian and The Observer. And until then, I had always assumed that newspapers were this big because it was cheaper to print on big sheets of paper. So I thought. Much to my surprise, I then learned that that was not true at all. In fact, it's slightly more expensive to print big sheets of paper rather than small ones. So I said to them, why do you do it? It's hugely impractical. At the time, every morning, I was traveling to London Business School from Notting Hill by tube. Well, try reading a newspaper in a busy tube in the morning or on a windy day outside or whatever it is. I said, why don't you reduce it? It's much more practical. It's, it's even cheaper. And then they said to me, no, 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 Fred, no, 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 no. Customers wouldn't want it. Customers wouldn't want it? No, because that's the way it is, and that's the way it's always been. Quality newspapers are broadsheets. That's, that's how everybody does it. That's how it's always been. Two years later, 2004, the Independent, as the very first newspaper in the world, halved the size of its newspaper and saw a surge in its circulation, basically saving them from bankruptcy. Half a year later, the Times followed half the size of its newspaper, saw a surge in circulation. Then the Guardian had to say, all right, then we're going to make it short, smaller. Surge in circulation. Then it started spreading to other countries in the world. And now in lots of countries all over the world, I don't know about Norway, but probably here as well, you see newspapers reducing their size, and usually a surge in circulation. Yes, customers did want it. Well, why wouldn't we? It's much more practical and cheaper. So then I thought, 
let me find out where that practice actually came from. Right? How it started, these big sheets of newspapers, because nobody could tell me. And then I found out that it started at a very precise location, at a very precise point in time. Namely, in the year 1715 in London. In 1715, the then English government decided to start taxing newspaper companies based on the number of pages that they printed. <laughs> After which newspaper companies said, well, we'll just make them this big and print as few as possible. <laughs> this tax law was abolished in 1855. And everybody just kept printing these big sheets of paper because, oh, that's the way it is. And that's what I mean with collective inertia. As you know, companies within the same industries can be remarkably similar in how they do things. In the processes, in terms of production, but also in terms of the culture that they have and so on. And quite often we don't quite know why, but that's how always, everybody does it and that's how always everybody has been doing it. Well, you know, sometimes the sprinkler system has been turned off. Uh, let, let, uh, let, let me give you a candidate. Because then often people say, well, then, then tell me one of those management myths uh, which is still ongoing. Well, the point is, that's actually very difficult. Because if we could know now and say, well, that's a myth, well, we would stop doing it. The point is, it's very difficult to see it because everybody does it this way and has always been doing it this way. But, but let me offer you a candidate. I'm also doing quite a bit of research on the pharmaceutical industry. And in the pharmaceutical industry, in most countries, it depends a bit on, uh, on the law, but in most countries, what is marketing for pharmaceutical companies is what they call detailing. And detailing, as many of you will know, um, uh, is nothing else than, say, uh, a person with a suitcase full of uh, pills and ointments who visits your doctor, trying to uh, convince your doctor to prescribe you those drugs. Uh, that, that's detailing. Direct, well, salespeople, in a way. Now, that is a big practice, not to be underestimated. These are numbers for the US, because that's what I could find. Um, drug companies spent about one-third of their revenue on this practice. One-third of their revenue for pharmaceutical companies. That's a lot of money, I can tell you. In comparison, for instance, because uh, drug companies always, of course, say that the prices of drugs have to be so high because they have to invest so much in R&D. Well, R&D in comparison in that same period was 14% of revenue. So they spent two and a half times as much on detailing alone. In 2000, there were 83,000 of those people with a uh, suitcase of pills and ointments running around uh, trying to convince doctors, which was about doubled from four years earlier. It's a big practice, believe me. But these two guys, they're at the bottom. Misek and Jacobsen, two professors from Columbia Business School, have done very elaborate research on the effectiveness of that practice. And they found out that it takes an average of three physical visits by one of these people with a suitcase to a doctor and giving 26 free samples to make a doctor prescribe it only once. Once. Now, that doesn't sound like a particularly efficient practice to me. So I started to talking to people in five different pharmaceutical companies and said, why do you do it? Seems hugely ineffective. It's very expensive, very low conversion. And I said, yes, Frank, um, we're also aware of this type of research, but we also have our own internal research on the topic. And our own internal research hasn't been able to provide conclusive evidence that the practice is not effective. <laughs> and I said, here where you're placing the bar here, right? You cannot, pr I can do a lot of research like that, you know? So for one of the companies, I even looked into this research. Um, and this company had in one year launched four new drugs. And to their credit, they had said, okay, we're going to launch two with detailing and two without, and then we'll see how it plays out. And then indeed, the two drugs with detailing did quite a bit better than the two drugs without detailing. I said, okay, all right, all right. By the way, how did you pick those two drugs to do with detailing and those two without? Why didn't you do this one without detailing? And then he said to me, no, 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 no. We couldn't take any risks with that one. That's supposed to be our next blockbuster, so we had to do that one with the... <laughs> then you're stacking the odds a little bit against them, of course. But that's exactly the point. 
if everybody does it this way, and we, then we cannot see evidence that something is ineffective. And in the absence of evidence that it's not effective, we don't really dare to take the plunge. Not coincidentally, therefore, it was the Independent which halved the size of its newspaper, because they had nothing to lose. They were going bankrupt anyway, and now they still exist. But my point is the following. This idea of collective inertia, that uh, we do it because everybody in our business does it this way and everybody has always been doing it this way, does not mean it's the best way of doing things. And sometimes it's worth questioning that way. I am absolutely convinced, also because we've been doing quite a bit of research on it, that every industry has practices like that. Things that we take for granted and we think, oh, why do we do it that way? That can be a great source of innovation and competitive advantage if you're the one to figure it out and be the first one to change it, as the independent did. Um, implementing these changes won't be easy. We're pretty set in doing things the wrong way. That's a little bit what it is. Companies become set in doing things a certain way. Sometimes that may have been a perfectly good way in some period of time, but when business circumstances change, which they inevitably do, it may be worth questioning them and doing them in a different way. Let me go on to my second point, um, what I call causal ambiguity. And again, I thought of an example what I could uh, use to, to best explain what I mean with causal ambiguity. Um, and the example I thought of was in the, well, from, from cultural anthropology again. Uh, because in cultural anthropology, there has been quite a lot of research on um, harmful cultural practices. And these harmful cultural practices are in a way quite puzzling, because anthropologists would always say, why don't these die out? Right? If they're harmful for the tribe, well, even if they wouldn't figure that one out, they would put the tribe at a disadvantage, and the tribe would disappear and lose competition. So you have to think of things like um, um, female circumcision or uh, foot binding in Asian China, where you would basically cripple women. Or you have certain tattooing practices in Tula, Polynesia, where the people receiving the tattoo would usually get infected and die. And it's stupid things like that. Why don't these stupid things disappear? And um, the cultural practice, the ritual that has mo received most research on this topic, um, is a, a, a practice among the Fora people in Papua New Guinea. The Fora people in Papua New Guinea, um, like many of our societies, Western societies, had a ritual uh, to bury their deceased relatives. However, at some point in time, in one of the villages of the Fora people, because the Fora people were a very large tribe, really hundreds of villages that could be days apart, but in one of those villages, at some point, I don't know, uh, Uncle Ed died. So they were standing at his funeral, Uncle Ed, his cousins or so, and then uh, one of the cousins said, uh, God, I'm hungry. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm hungry. Food. And the other ones would go, what, what? You want to eat Uncle Ed? I said, well, yeah. Well, all right then. And they ate Uncle Ed. Now, three weeks later, I don't know, uh, um, Auntie Mary died. So he was standing at the funeral of Auntie Mary. She said, uh, remember what we did with Uncle Ed? Uh, so they ate Auntie Mary. In fact, not for long, everybody in the village started eating their deceased relatives rather than burying them. Now, um, on one of these happy occasions, uh, there was a visitor from a neighboring village. Hospitable as the Fora people are, they said, well, dig in. And he joined in with the feast, went back to his own village, and when someone died there, he said, well, do you know what they do in the other village? And not for long, they started eating their deceased relatives there as well. In fact, over the course of a couple of years, this ritual, this new ritual, started spreading to all the villages of the Fora people, till everybody ate their deceased relatives rather than buried them. Now, I have to say, this practice had some obvious advantages. And the obvious advantage was that they were, well, they were not so hungry anymore. Well, m maybe neither are you, but uh, they were not so hungry anymore. And, that, and famine was a real problem among the Fora people, so it solved a tricky problem. It also created some other problems in the process. Because the Fora people, not to let any good food uh, go to waste, ate everything, 
uh, including the brain of their deceased relatives, which made sure that after a number of years, they started to develop a deadly nerve disease. And the deadly nerve disease they refer to as Kuru, which is basically a variant of Creutzfeldt-Jakob, or mad cow disease. And in fact, the four people, after a number of years, started getting ill by the hundreds, the thousands. They started dying by the thousands until more than half of the whole tribe, which was a very large tribe, had died from this disease alone. Um, and by the way, uh, the only reason why it ended is because Australia invaded Papua New Guinea in 1956 or something like that and put an end to it. Uh, and by the way, that was not because the Australians understood that this ritual was leading to this disease. Uh, they just thought it was gross. No, anyway. Even Australians thought it was gross. Was the <laughs> but here's the, what's the point? The point here is the following. Why did the four people not stop with this harmful practice? Well, it's not because they couldn't see the harmful consequences. Oh yes, they could see the harmful consequences. They were dying by the thousands. But what they could not see is the connection between cause and effect. They could not see that, ah, we're having all these problems because 10 years ago, we started eating our deceased relatives. And that's what we call causal ambiguity. It's not like we don't observe the effects, it's that we don't understand the causal connection. And that, in fact, very often happens in the world of business. And let me just give you one example, although I could, I could go on for a whole afternoon giving you examples of this, but let me pick one example. And that's the example of what we call process management systems. And for instance, um, uh, a process management, lean is probably a process. I don't know much about lean. I hear a lot of talk about that, especially in Scandinavia for some reason. I'm sure it's a process management system. Uh, like Six Sigma is a process management system. ISO 9000 is a process management system. Uh, the old total quality management was a process management system, and so on. What process management systems do, in all way, all do in one way or another, is to say, well, find out best practices. Right? Find out the best practices in your organization, how to best run a particular process. Document that process, make sure that everybody follows that best practice in your organization, and you will see that efficiency goes up and productivity and quality and all these nice things. Now, there's been quite a bit of research on process management systems, including ISO 9000, for example. The first thing is, if you genuinely implement them, they work. Right? They lead to an improvement in productivity and efficiency and quality very quickly. However, Professors Banner and Tushman, then from the Wharton School and the Harvard Business School, did research on the long-term consequences of process management systems, including ISO 9000. And they found the following. They found that firms in various industries that implemented ISO 9000, five, six years down the line, saw their innovation plummet. And you don't read that in the process management system handbooks. And my guess is that some of you will have an intuition why that is. And that's because innovation well, requires doing things in a different way, requires variation, requires experimentation, requires sometimes making a mistake which then appears to be good for something else or something, but it requires doing things in different ways. Most of them will fail, but some of them will lead to innovation. Well, if you follow such a process management system, it's basically about standardization. Figure out the best practice, make sure everybody follows the best practice. Well, that's wonderful for your efficiency and productivity, not so good for your innovation. But the point is, that harmful effect will only materialize after five years or so. And after five years, these companies do see, gosh, we don't have enough innovation output, and we hire McKinsey or whatever it is. And that's because there's causal ambiguity. They, have, they see their lack of innovation, but have trouble figuring out and say, ah, that's because five years ago, we implemented that process management system. That's what I mean with causal ambiguity. It's not that you don't see and experience the negative consequences. You do. But you have trouble tying together cause and effect. And by the way, huh, the short-term beneficial effects, namely improvement in productivity, or we're not so hungry anymore for the four people, make sure that lots of people adopt it and lots of companies adopt it. And in fact, for that period before problems start, it can nicely spread because all these management myths, these sort of harmful practices, are all very easy to imitate. It's not so easy, difficult to imitate eating Uncle Ed. Nor is it very difficult to implement an ISO 9000 or lean system or even consultants that help you do it. That brings me to my third one. 
something that I call management myopia. Um, and this one I'm not going to um, uh, explain through some gross example, or maybe so, because I want to explain it through my own research project that I recently finished. I recently finished a big research project um, on IVF clinics in the UK, so fertility clinics. Um, fertility clinics, by the way, uh, they have a very objective uh, su uh, success measure. It's easy to determine whether the uh, procedure resulted into a success or not. You, know, you, you physically see it. So the success rate for IVF clinics is simply percentage of treatments that has resulted into a pregnancy, or actually a live birth. Now, a number of years ago, well, quite a few number of years ago, 15 years ago or so, the English government decided, as in many countries, that uh, for customer uh, choice and uh, transparency in the industry and all these wonderful nice things, that IVF clinics had to publish their success rate. And you can. So there's a central website, even in the UK, where all fertility clinics in the UK are listed, and you can simply see uh, what percentage of patients they get pregnant. Now, as you can imagine, this hugely influences consumer choice. And most IVF clinics are private clinics. Um, and everybody buying this rather expensive treatment will go online and see, is, is this clinic any good? And if they're not any good, I'm going to pick a different clinic. However, this has had some unexpected consequences, um, this government intervention, you could say. Because the success rate of an IVF clinic is not only determined by how good they are. The success rate of an IVF clinic is also determined by who comes through the door. The quality of the input, you could say. <laughs> Meaning, some women are just easier to get pregnant than others. And some clinics, some more than others, have started to select their patients quite a bit. Meaning that, say, if, um, um, uh, if a 47-year-old woman shows up at the door with one ovary and says, all right, I've been trying for six years now, they think, oh, gosh, she's going to mess up our success rate. <laughs> and, and they say, oh, well, well, this other clinic is actually more suitable to you. So, so they find ways of refusing this patient. When, on the other hand, I say a uh, 23-year-old uh, shows up in perfect health, and says, oh, me and my boyfriends, we've been trying now for four months and still nothing. Uh, or sex? No, we haven't had that. Oh, 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 come on in, come on in. Come on. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you pregnant. You know? So what they did is start, they, say, they started selecting at the gate, is what I called it. Now, as I said, some clinics do that more than others. So th then we did the following. I did this with a colleague of mine called Mihaela Stan um, uh, at University College London. And we did the following. On the vertical axis here, you see the success rate percentage of treatments that result into a pregnancy. And then we measured how many difficult patients did clinics do. And some clinics do a lot of difficult patients, and others, uh, they, they send them away and only do 23-year-olds in perfect health. And we found the following. Not surprising, clinics that did a lot of difficult patients have much lower success rates than clinics that only do 23-year-olds in perfect health. Right? The top, bottom, the top one. But then we did something, well, if you don't mind me say, something rather clever. <laughs> oh, I played a small part in this. We measured here on the vertical axis their cumulative experience with fertility treatments, with IVF treatments. And then we estimated something we call a learning curve. All organizations become better over time uh, in their production. There are learning curve studies in every industry. So I've seen learning curve studies in uh, airplanes, in cars, in bottles, in pizzas, you name it. Uh, making the first pizza or the first airplane is very difficult and very expensive, but gradually over time we become much better at it. And then we make fewer mistakes and lower costs and these type of things. So organizations become better over time. And then we observed the following. We saw that indeed clinics become better over time, but the dotted line the clinics that only treat 23-year-olds in perfect health improved very little over time. The clinics that treated a lot of difficult patients as well learned much quicker. In fact, they learned so much quicker that after about a year or so, the lines crossed. And after three to four years, the clinics that did a lot of difficult patients actually had higher success rates than the clinics that only treated 23-year-olds in perfect health in spite of doing many more difficult patients. 
And then, of course, these clinics, after five years, they said, oh, our success rate is much lower than our competitors. How is that possible? Again, they had trouble figuring out that's because five years ago, they actually started doing easy patients only. And usually the solutions that they then do is say, well, we have to select our patients better, which is just counterproductive. But that's what I mean with management myopia. And what we mean with myopia is short-sightedness. We see the short-term consequences of our actions, Hey, if we carefully select only easy patients, our success rate goes up. That's what we do see. But we don't necessarily see the long-term consequences of our actions. And sometimes these long-term consequences may do the complete opposite thing of what the short-term ones may do. But in our decision-making as managers, we base our decisions and our subsequent actions on the short-term consequences. And we see, oh, this practice works, let's continue doing this. So that's what I meant with management myopia. We see and therefore base our decisions on the short-term consequences of our actions. Again, I could give you many examples, and I, and I will restrain myself doing this. But for instance, there's a big research project by these professors, Guthrie and Data, on downsizing. Now, you know, oh, we're in trouble, let's boot out a number of people. That will reduce our costs. Yeah, that's very nice. Booting out people will indeed very quickly reduce your costs and then, of course, improve your performance. What we do know from a lot of research is actually there are much more harmful long-term consequences in terms of the morale of your staff and increased attrition and so on. Uh, so actually, most of these downsizing efforts don't work at all and are in fact counterproductive. Let me not go in depth on all these things, but the point is we see the short-term consequences of our actions, not the long-term ones, and those become the basis of our subsequent decision-making. Number four which you will see is related. Something that I call self-perpetuating myths. Or actually, I plagiarized this term from a journalist of the Daily Telegraph. Uh, so I like this title of a piece of, very much that they wrote about my research, so now I pretend it's mine. <laughs> and self-perpetuating myths, I thought I could best explain using an example um, from a research project done by a colleague of mine, Olaf Sorensen. Uh, actually, he was a colleague at the time, he's now at Yale. But at the time of this research project, he was at London Business School, which enabled them to go to Yale and so on. Sure. Anyway, Olaf Sorensen, together with David Wagerspak, um, did research on film distributors in the US. So film distributors meaning not the uh, companies making films, but the ones putting them in cinemas. And uh, Olaf and David wanted to know, um, these film distributors, what do they need to see in films that will make them confident this film will become a success at the box office? And because they have to decide beforehand which films are we going to purchase and invest in and so on. Oh, they interviewed a bunch of people and uh, they came up with a list of variables that are then should be, according to these people, predictors of box office success. And, and to be honest, that is a list that you and I could have made uh, during the break here. Because they said, well, the, the number of stars on the cast is a good predictor of box office success. Uh, the combined experience of the production team or uh, the number of prior box office successes that the director has had, and so on. A, a list of pretty obvious predictors of these films will do well at the box office. Now, what Olaf and David subsequently did, for hundreds of films, they measured box office success, put that in a statistical model called a regression analysis, regressed one on the other, and found out, yes, they're right. These are indeed predictors of box office success. Now, that would be rather boring if you had laughed at that. But then Olaf did something clever. He also measured the amount of resources that these film distributors invested in the different films that they purchased. And then you have to think about um, things like the, the, the size of the marketing budget that they assigned to a film, or uh, the number of opening screens, or what, what time of the year that they put them in cinemas, uh, because Christmas, for instance, is a much better time than, I don't know, April or so. And he measured that for all these films, and then he found the following. These people invested more resources, like marketing budget, in films with, uh, with variables that should be predictors of box office success, and then, uh, indeed, these films did better at the box office. But here's the tricky thing. When he put that in his statistical model, the original top relationship completely disappeared. 
Now, what does this mean? This means that the one and only reason why films with these characteristics did better at the box office is because they invested more in them in terms of assigning resources. But their beliefs about what would make a box office success were complete nonsense. The only reason why these films became a success is because they made them a success. And then in hindsight, huh, they said, well, these films, oh, let's give them a lot of budget and a lot of opening screens. And then they, indeed they did better at the box office. And then these people said, see, I already knew beforehand. Oh, I really know my business. No, you don't. You have wrong beliefs about your business. You just make your own beliefs come true. But that's a tricky thing. Because there's nothing unnatural about their behavior. Of course we invest more in the things that we think will become a success. But the tricky thing is, as a result of that, they will become a success. And then we say, see, how good are we? We know our business really well. No, you don't. In fact, they would have been better off had they just given everybody the same budget. They would have already done better. And that's a bit self-perpetuating myth. We base our decisions on our beliefs, as a result of which we make our beliefs come true, as a result of which we reinforce these beliefs which makes them exceptionally difficult to catch. You can see this in all walks of life. I remember a, a research project um, by two educational psychologists. And these educational psychologists uh, did research on primary school children. And they went to all sorts of primary schools uh, on, say, day one of the academic year. And after the end of day one, they would ask the teacher, uh, which of these children do you think will do well this year? And then they would say, uh, ah, Janet, ah, smart girl. Uh, Harry, ha Harry is a bit more mentally challenged. And then they would say, Ron, no, oh, so he will do well, and so on. So for each of the children, they would have expectations who would do well this year and who wouldn't. Subsequently, they came back at various points in the year, and they measured how much time and attention teachers gave to different children. And guess what? Teachers would have a lot more attention and time for the children they thought would do well academically. And those children who are a bit more academically challenged, they said, well, you do something for yourself or whatever. And then at the end of the year, indeed, these children did a lot better. And then these teachers said, see, I already knew that on day one. No, you just made your own reality come true. So looking at the end results doesn't necessarily tell you what is the most promising, promising thing at the start which, like I said, makes it very difficult to catch these things. Let me move to my last one, selection bias. Selection bias is probably the term that some of you did recognize, because that's an accepted statistical term and a statistical property which you could say underlies many of these first four ones. And I thought how I could best um, explain what we mean with selection bias. And about a year ago, a year and a half ago or so, I read an interview in some magazine, I forgot which magazine, but it was an interview with an actor called Dick Van Dyke. Some of you may know Dick Van Dyke, some of you do. He's, he's not super famous, he, uh, let's put it this way, he's one of these B celebrities who thinks of himself as an A celebrity. Uh, of which there's a lot in the UK, by the way. But anyway, he's, uh, he's pretty famous. In that interview with Dick Van Dyke, uh, he recalled from his youth an experience that he said, well, I was surfing off the coast somewhere in the US. Uh, I was very f quite far into the open sea uh, surfing, and then there was a big wave, and I was thrown off my surfboard, and, and, and I looked around, and I didn't see my surfboard anymore. And I found myself in open sea with all these waves, and I, and I said, well, just when I was about to start panicking, a porpoise showed up. And Dick Van Dyke said, the poor boys looked at me and started pushing me. And after a while, I saw the shore, and he was pushing me towards the shore. And there it was me, saved by a poor boys. And that's why we can now enjoy all these wonderful films with Dick Van Dyke, thanks to this poor boys. <laughs> now, I don't know whether this story is true or whether he was seeking a little bit of publicity end of, uh, at the end of his career. But I do know, because I looked into it a bit, and as you may know, lots of countries and cultures, from South America to the Aboriginals in Australia, whatever, have stories about porpoises um, 
uh, saving shipwrecked sailors by pushing them safely towards the shore. So, in fact, I do believe that because there are so many of these similar myths in different countries, that there's probably some truth to it. Probably there have been shipwrecked sailors who have been pushed safely towards the shore. So I read up on these animals a bit, uh, because of course there's research on this by marine biologists, and uh, it turns out they're very playful animals. So for instance, I remember a, 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 an experiment where there was a big bassa, and there was a porpoise in it, and then they would throw a big heavy ball into this bassa, and this porpoise would just keep pushing this ball around endlessly in all sorts of directions. And that's the point. In all sorts of directions. These animals just like pushing stuff around. <laughs> they don't care where they push it. They just boy, like pushing stuff. So I'm sure that some of these sailors get safely pushed towards the shore. But for every sailor safely pushed towards the shore, there are probably sea sailors who've been pushed into open sea. You know? And these poor sailors trying frantically to reach the shore every time this bloody poor boy shows up and pushes them back out again. But the point is, these guys, we never hear from, right? We only hear this one individual saying, oh, this wonderful animal saved me. And that's what we call selection bias. We only see a selection of the outcome, namely the successful cases, and we make inferences about that and say, oh, that must be a good thing. And we don't take into account the same courses of action that might have led to a failure. In fact, this led um, a famous uh, uh, management professor at Stanford, Jim March, to say the following. He said, the best performing managers are by definition incompetent. <laughs> and what does he mean with this? Well, he says, well, what is a really good manager? What is a really good decision maker? Well, very good decisions are this, right? Um, so, expected return is a high average expected return and low risk. So, low risk means a, a narrow statistical distribution, right? Low, low variance, low risk. Good decision maker. Good. What's a really bad, stupid decision maker? Ah, a stupid decision maker would do the opposite, right? A stupid decision maker would lower average expected return for higher risk. Now, that's pretty stupid, huh? except higher risk for low expected return. Ah. The tricky thing is that little thing there in the corner. Because if you select the 1% best performing managers, from which distribution are they most likely to come? From the narrow distribution of good managers? No. If you just select the 1% top performing managers, they're much more likely to come from the distribution of dumb managers who just got lucky. <laughs> now, and again, this may seem far-fetched to you, but let me tell you, at my old university in the Netherlands, uh, Tilburg University, um, we, we, we had a competition which you have in many universities. Um, um, well, not along the business school, but uh, 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 you give students a, a budget of 1 million euros, a fictional budget, of course, and then you tell these students, well, go play the stock market for three months uh, with this budget, and who, after three months, has the highest return, uh, gets an award and a job at uh, some investment bank, Goldman Sachs, or whatever it is. This is the best way to make sure you recruit an idiot. Because the only way to win a competition like this is take your entire 1 million euro budget, find the most stupid investment around that you can find that nobody wants to invest in, place your entire 1 million budget on this, and then simply get lucky. <laughs> now, 99 out of 100 times you won't, but if you want to be the single one to come out on top, you have to do something stupid like that. Because good decision makers, well, manage to balance return with risk, they, on average, will do better, but they will never be the single one that comes out on top. Uh, I do apologize if any of you ever got recruited that way. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule. Um, anyway, uh, well, I, again, this is a, may seem an extreme example, but that's what we call selection bias. I'll give you a, a real-life example then. That will be the last example of today, but a real-life example, the real organization, the Royal Air Force. In the Second World War, the Royal Air Force set up a team that had, so 1943 or so, and the team had to inspect uh, planes that were returning from Germany from bombing missions. What this team would do is to say, well, where do the Germans try to shoot our planes? So they would inspect returning planes for bullet holes. 
And then it would form and say, well, they're in the middle of the plane. There's a lot of bullet holes. Uh, bastards are aiming for the middle. And they would fortify the middle of the plane. Didn't help a single bit. In fact, was counterproductive. No, uh, no return, no, no more planes came back. And why? It seems so obvious. Well, because it's exactly the wrong thing to do. These poor German kids in 1943, they were not aiming for the middle of the plane. They were just spraying bullets in the air, or everywhere. The point is, if you would get hit in the middle of the plane, wouldn't be nice, but it was not such a vital area of the plane, you would still make it home. If you would get hit on the tail, for instance, which would ha happen just as often, well, you would make it home and you would end up in the North Sea. And then this team would inspect and say, bastards, try to shoot us again in the middle of the plane. Let's fortify it. No, that's exactly the wrong place. That's the part you don't have to fortify. It's the part where you don't find bullet holes, where you had to fortify. Now, in fact, if you start to think of it, there's lots of instances of selection bias around. Now, uh, uh, one example, for example, uh, customer satisfaction surveys. So I'm often uh, so in a keynote speech on stage or so after the customer satisfaction survey. Who do we survey? Well, our existing customers. And I say, well, wow. And, and invariably, the conclusion is, they say we do pretty well. Well done. Yeah, if you didn't do very well, they wouldn't be your customers anymore. And I say, only in these areas we have to do a bit better. No, you don't. That's the middle of the plane. That's apparently what they don't care about. You have to be aware of what selection you're making before basing your judgment and decisions on those. Let me leave it at that. But that's what I mean with collective inertia, monkeys in the cage, uh, causal ambiguity. Uh, hey, we don't know what is causing this deadly nerve disease uh, called Kuru. Hey, it's Uncle Ed from 10 years back. Management myopia. Uh, necessarily what increases your performance in the short term doesn't do it in the long run. Self-perpetuating myths, we make our own beliefs come true. And selection bias, we see a selection of the outcome. Anyway, that's all I had to say. Well, I could say a lot more, but I won't. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a bit as well. <laughs>